Well, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons here at the University of Utah on the heart valve team. And I wanted to switch gears a little bit and, and focus on bicuspid aortic valve, which is a, an important clinical entity. And, and with the transcatheter era, the management of, of bicuspid valve is evolving. Here are my disclosures. So this is the outline of the talk today. I'm going to touch briefly just as a reminder on the epidemiology and natural history of bicuspid aortic valve, including valve morphology. I want to touch a little bit on bicuspid aortic disease or aortopathy. And then we'll go through some of the surgical uh, valve repair and replacement options. And then finally, uh, transcatheter valve replacement and talk about its role in bicuspid disease. Okay, so um, most of the audience I'm sure is familiar with this clinical entity. It's very common. It's the most common congenital cardiac lesion affecting one to 2% of the population. More common in males than females in about a four to one ratio. And these valves are, are not normal uh, at birth and they, they have, these patients have a high risk for developing valve dysfunction. Up to 30 to 40% of patients over their lifetime uh, will have valve dysfunction. I wanted to just touch on embryology, uh, mostly to introduce the concept of, of bicuspid aortopathy, but this is a bit of a busy slide, but if you look on the top figure there, that yellow is the second heart field cells, which fill in and form the aortic root, the first portion of the aorta and the aortic valve. And the leaflets themselves are formed from the endocardial cushions uh, from the endothelial layer, but the the, the um, aorta and the aortic root and the aortic valve are all very closely related embryologically, which uh, ties in when you have problems leading to bicuspid aortic valve, the aorta is often abnormal as well. So the natural history of bicuspid aortic valve, as we mentioned, uh, high proportion will develop some degree of aortic stenosis and about a third at least will, will go on to severe aortic stenosis with symptoms that would require valve replacement. And this is often seen uh, much earlier than patients with, with normal tricuspid valve anatomy. And often in the third to fifth decade of life, that these patients uh, develop severe aortic stenosis and require intervention. In addition to the valve dysfunction, there is a significant risk of aortic aneurysm, uh, regardless uh, of valve intervention. We'll talk more about that in a second. So I wanted to just touch on the morphology differences of bicuspid aortic valve. This is a very heterogeneous clinical syndrome. And this is the, the Seavers classification schema, which is one of the most commonly used one. Um, these are just some surgical pictures to demonstrate the difference in morphology. And these really can be thought of as separate clinical entities. The type zero uh, valve here, which is a, almost also called a unicuspid valve, uh, or, a, or a true bicuspid, excuse me, um, these patients have a, a very symmetrical uh, 180 degree orientation of the leaflets. Uh, most commonly is fusion of the left and right with one rough A, where you have a very thick commissure with the fusion of the left and right uh, uh, aortic sinuses uh, and the commissural cusp. Uh, this is more like a, a tricuspid valve that is fused. And you can see that this valve uh, can take on a relatively asymmetric morphology. And then less commonly is a two rafe valve where you have fusions of, of two different uh, commercial areas. But these valves, you can see just from these pictures that the uh, heterogeneity of this, of this syndrome is very uh, significant. And just to highlight, this is not just an anatomic difference. These can be functional and, and, and have influence on outcomes. This is a study looking at fusion of the right and non commissure valve versus the right and left. In, in the red line there, the, the right non-fusion patients have a significantly uh, increased rate of intervention and significantly different outcomes. So not only do we have anatomic heterogeneity, we have clinical outcome heterogeneity uh, for this valve syndrome. So bicuspid valve is, is a broad category that includes all of these different morphologies. And so once someone has a diagnosis of bicuspid, it's not sufficient just to say bicuspid valve. You really have to understand the morphology of these valves. I want to mention aortopathy because this is, uh, you cannot separate these two clinical entities. So anyone with a bicuspid valve is at significant risk for developing an aortic aneurysm. These are typically in the, in the aortic root or ascending and uh, can be uh, associated with significant morbidity and mortality due to the risk of aortic dissection or other aortic complications. So any patient with a bicuspid aortic valve, we should, should be screened for uh, aortic aneurysm as well. And the genetics of this syndrome are, 
are very complex and, and not well understood, but this is thought to be a familial inherited uh, condition in at least some uh, a significant subset of patients. There's three main morphologic subtypes of the aortic aneurysm. Uh, most common is the supracoronary or just an isolated ascending aneurysm. There are as a, about 10, 10 to 11% have a root phenotype. Uh, thought that the uh, aortic root uh, aneurysm phenotype with bicuspid valve is a more aggressive aortopathy. And then some patients have both. This is important to, to kind of fold into the management decisions for uh, bicuspid aortic valve. So I'm gonna start with surgical treatments. So this is the traditional gold standard for aortic valve replacement. These are old data showing that if you leave a valve alone, the patients do worse than if you replace the valve. We all know that. But uh, I think this is especially important when thinking about bicuspid aortic valve patients because the management paradigms um, not, are not necessarily the same as in the traditional uh, tricuspid aortic valve patients. And I'm going to put this up. These are the partner three data from the TOWER trial looking at um, these are not bicuspid valve patients. Those are excluded from this. But my point for this slide is that surgical aortic valve replacement remains a very successful procedure. And the surgical results reported in the partner three trial, which is probably one of the largest uh, modern series of surgical patients, the results were quite good. And in these tricuspid valve patients, it just so happened the TAVA results were better, which is great for these patients. And it, it is driving the, as Dr. Tandar mentioned, that TAVA is really becoming standard of care for patients with aortic stenosis. And uh, I highlight this because the question then becomes, can we apply the same parameters or the same clinical decision-making to bicuspid patients? And clearly the uh, outcomes are good. And the question is, will TAVR outcomes be better uh, with bicuspids? One other thing to mention is uh, mechanical valves. And so obviously, uh, mechanical valves must be put in with surgery, open surgery. And in, as the bicuspid patients are often younger, mechanical valves offer a durability advantage, which is appealing in these younger patients. One thing to mention is that uh, there is some evidence that mechanical valves, if you look over many decades, may have a slight survival advantage over biologic valves. Now these data need to be interpreted carefully because these are largely historical at this point because these, were, these patients were mostly before the transcatheter era. So we know that valve and valve, transcatheter valve replacement is, is bringing down the risk of reoperation for, for biologic valves. But certainly mechanical valve replacement is a viable strategy and, and certainly something to talk about with each patient and bring up as a, as a potential treatment strategy for bicuspid valve patients who are younger. And then aortic repair, aortic valve repair is, is something to consider, especially in patients with primary aortic insufficiency rather than aortic stenosis. These patients often have annular aortic ectasia or dilated aortic root, and often the valve leaflets are repairable and a valve sparing approach is possible for patients who have an aortic root aneurysm, even with a bicuspid aortic valve. And this is certainly appealing for younger patients. So this is all part of the conversation. And I think this highlights the, the complexity of bicuspid aortic valve disease. And at least in our center, we've really uh, appreciated the heart team concept. I think having a multidisciplinary approach to these patients is absolutely critical because all of these patients, um, each one is, uh, is an individual. And as I mentioned, the heterogeneity of the clinical syndrome makes uh, decision-making very complex and must be personalized for each patient. Uh, just as a reminder of the American guidelines for aneurysm, any uh, aneurysm above five and a half centimeters or 55 millimeters should be repaired surgically. And aneurysms in the 45 to 55 millimeter range should be considered. So certainly the as bi patients with bicuspid aortic valve are evaluated, uh, uh, understanding the uh, status of their ascending aorta and aortic root is critical to decision-making uh, in these patients. And just as a reminder, uh, elective or prophylactic aortic surgery is very safe in, in the kind of modern era. This is a large study from the North American STS database of almost 9,000 patients with 30-day mortality in the 2% range. So this is a very effective treatment uh, in patients that yeah, need patient, uh, Your slide cannot be uh, performed here. We cannot see the, the slide of yours. The slide of yours. 
Can you share it? On here. Hang on. I'm getting back to it here. I apologize for that. Okay, so now moving on to transcatheter aortic valve replacement and what is the role for TAVR and bicuspid patients? So originally this was off label. The, the original large trials, the partner trial, the SIRTAVI trial excluded bicuspid aortic valve patients. So the, the major TAVR series do not include bicuspid patients and early indications did not include uh, bicuspid valve patients. And even in the, the most recent guidelines, which were published this week um, by the AHA and circulation, the uh, in terms of the anatomy, uh, bicuspid aortic valve uh, is said to favor surgical aortic valve replacement, but that's a kind of a nebulous term. What does that mean, favors? And I think that um, you know the reality of, of the situation in 2020 is that uh, TAVR is being performed quite commonly for bicuspid aortic valve. So this is just a recent series of uh, several studies, several studies that have been published with a case series looking at bicuspid uh, aortic valve patients with aortic stenosis treated with TAVR. And so clearly this is being done. We do these, this quite often at our center. And uh, so I think that the, you know, TAVR for bicuspid valve is a, is a, a reasonable option. This is a study from the, the uh, National Inpatient Database in the U.S. just looking at, uh, this is transcatheter valve replacement versus surgical valve replacement for bicuspid uh, patients. And looking at the major outcome measures, including mortality, um, shock, stroke, um, and other complications are very similar between TAVR and SAVR. Uh, not surprisingly, the risk for blood transfusion is much higher with open surgery. And interestingly, the risk for complete heart block and permanent pacemaker is somewhat higher for TAVR. But these are excellent results in, in this uh, series. And then looking at uh, TAVR outcome for bicuspid patients versus tricuspid um, aortic stenosis patients, the outcomes are very similar. There is a slightly higher increase um, incidence of heart block and permanent pacemaker with bicuspid patients, which really uh, highlights the kind of clinical complexity and, and procedural complexity for, for bicuspid aortic valve patients. So this is one point that I wanna highlight is that the morphology, as I mentioned earlier, is quite heterogeneous. And you know, one bicuspid valve is not the same as another. And one thing that we really focus on in our heart team at the University of Utah is the, is the symmetry of the valve. So the more symmetrical and more circular the valve uh, annulus in the valve leaflets and the aortic root, um, the more circular it is, the more amenable it is to taper. I think that the more asymmetric, then you have um, asymmetric calcified leaflets or, or a more oval shaped root and annulus, then the risk of paravalvular leak and uh, poor hemodynamic outcomes starts to increase. And those are patients that you may want to consider surgery. And this is how we approach these patients. We look at the morphology very closely. And, and this goes back to what Dr. Ibrahim was saying about the spatial, re uh, spatial resolution of our imaging modalities that are really critical in bicuspid valve patients because we really need to understand the morphology of the root. And there on the right is a, a picture of a a relatively asymmetric deployment of a sapien valve in a bicuspid patient, just highlighting the, the, the nuances of positioning in these patients. And I think that uh, bicuspid valves are amenable to TAVR, but with this very important caveat that each patient must be closely uh, evaluated for the uh, anatomic uh, morphology of the valve and the root. One other thing to mention is there's a recent study uh, in Jack uh, last month about uh, neurologic complications with, with bicuspid uh, versus tricuspid aortic valve in TAVR. And I think that these are early data and these need to be borne out in larger series, but there is a potential concern for slightly increased risk for neurologic complications in bicuspid valve patients undergoing TAVR. And this may be due to the uh, irregularity of the calcium, the more complexity of the procedure, most um, bicuspid valve patients need to undergo a balloon aortic valvuloplasty before uh, deploying the valve. So that extra uh, balloon uh, intervention in the valve may slightly increase the stroke risk. It's not totally clear what this is gonna be um, as we get more data, but this is just something to be aware of and potentially counsel the patients uh, who are gonna undergo TAVR that there might be a slightly increased risk of stroke with the bicuspid versus the tricuspid valve. And then finally, uh, I'm an aortic surgeon, so I'm, of course, going to focus on the aorta. Uh, 
And just this, these data are interesting. These are patients who have undergone, these are all surgical valve replacement patients, but on the top graph, we see that even after valve replacement, the, the aorta in bicuspid patients has an increased risk of dilation over time. And so even if patients have a successful valve replacement with either surgery or TAVR, the ascending aorta and aortic root need to be continually monitored over the, the next uh, you know, years to decades because these patients still have risk of developing an aortopathy and an aortic aneurysm even after effective or successful valve replacement. So in conclusion, aortic valve disease is common and these patients often need intervention at younger ages. And TAVR is a completely uh, viable option for these patients with the very important caveats that I mentioned during the talk. And so this really highlights the need for a comprehensive multidisciplinary valve team where you have uh, surgeons, cardiologists, imagers, everyone working together to really understand the best approach for each individual patient. And I think that having a, a a individualized uh, approach for each patient will give you the best chance of having the best outcomes for these uh, kind of clinically complex patients. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions.